This podcast is sponsored by the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. My name is Dr. Tom Wyshewski, and I will be your host for this ongoing podcast series. By continuing to interview the world's leading authorities in orthokeratology and myopia control, I hope to keep you up to date on the latest news, research, and information, and to give you the tools that you can use to better serve your patients and to help grow your practice. Recently in America, we inaugurated a new president, and upcoming soon on the third Monday of February, we will be observing President's Day, which is when America celebrates the birth of our two greatest presidents, George Washington, who was born on February 22nd, and Abraham Lincoln, who was born on February 12th. In keeping with this presidential spirit, I bring you not one, but two of the greatest presidents in orthokeratology history. It is my pleasure to introduce the president of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, Dr. Carrie Herzberg. Carrie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Tom. It's great to be here. But I'm not done yet. I'm also pleased to welcome straight from Venice, Italy, the president of the European Academy of Orthokeratology, Dr. Marino Fromente. Now, Marino also happens to be the vice president of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. Marino, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Tom. All right, gentlemen. Vision by Design is coming up in Dallas this April. And as in the past, the main conference will run from Thursday through Sunday. And also as in the past, the boot camp for newcomers will be held on the Wednesday prior to the main conference. Boot camp, which is hosted by Dr. Caroline Kalki and I, is a great step-by-step -step tutorial on the science behind OrthoK, how to fit the OrthoK lens, how to troubleshoot the fit, and even how to fit OrthoK into your practice. It is well received every year, but as I said, it's for doctors who are new to OrthoK. Our more seasoned OrthoK fitters have been asking for something similar but more advanced. They want a very practical how to guide for more advanced cases, and that is why I invited you on the podcast. Last year on the Wednesday before the main conference, for the first time ever, you presented an advanced OrthoK workshop, and it was quite a hit. This year, you are again presenting an advanced OrthoK workshop on the Wednesday before the main conference. I know that it's going to be different than what you presented last year, and I know that the title is A Global Approach on Myopia Control. So I would like for you today to give us a preview of what to expect in this advanced workshop. But before we do that, Marino, can you sort of fill us in on really the why you're doing this? Yes, well, that's an idea Carrie and I had a few years ago when we, we were talking about uh, our profession. And, you know, in our profession, we are dealing, which it can be uh, optometry or and ophthalmology too, we are dealing with the eye and we are dealing also with vision. We are dealing with the structure of the eye and the function of, visual, of the visual process. So we wanted to expand our approach, uh, which was initially with orthokratology, which is a structural approach, and also include the functional approach of uh, uh, the function of vision, including uh, posture, the effect of lenses and prism, the fact of make the vision more flexible like VT. So we wanted to do it something different and have a total picture of the of myopia control. That sounds great. Now, we know that worldwide myopia has reached epidemic proportions. So, Carrie, why don't you get us started by touching on the epidemiology of this explosion of myopia? Yeah, you know, Tom, it's it's amazing to watch it. If it isn't so, you know, if it wasn't so scary, it's a systemic problem now within in, involved in the human system itself. And uh, until we delve into that process and why, what is, is the systemic about it? I mean, I think we're going to be at a loss to truly do something about it. So a lot of this course that we're dealing with today, with it at the meeting, will be dealing with that that approach to finding out what's wrong, and it goes it goes from the habits of our patients to the habits of our doctors. So it's a total systemic problem within our 
the human race, and we have to kind of figure this thing out and solve it with ourselves and through as a as a uh, as a technological center here uh, in, in, that we are is now the technologies that we have going on today. So it's a multi-tasked and multi-complicated problem. Okay, well. Marino, could you touch on kind of the genesis of this explosion of myopia? Tell us what it's all about. Well, but first of all, I would like to discuss about uh, the vision. Because, you know, we, we have the eye, which is a structure that needs to be healthy. And this is why we want to keep myopia low. And so the, the eye has to provide the best optical picture to be an, analyzed by the brain. But vision is the result of this analysis of the brain, which is directing the behavior of the organism in reaction of what has per perceived. So it's much more than 2020 vision. We need vision in two different ways, and this is extremely important. We have a detailed and sharp knowledge of the world in front of us, but vision we, we need is to guide us in our action. Then, and this is important for us and for myopia, we have a, a parallel stream, the central and discriminative uh, in one side and the peripheral and ambient on the other. And they are extremely important. We have to take this into consideration in our practice. We have also have to take into consideration in, in developing the strategies for myopia control. We all know the importance of periphery, and periphery has, is getting more important than in the past in the development of the process of ometropization, for instance, but also in the process of developing the strategies for myopia control. So, in the workshop, we will analyze all factors involved with development of visual disorders. And among these, we, we have myopia. Okay. Carrie, can you maybe get into some of the lifestyle changes that have occurred from past to present and how that maybe is playing into this? Uh, that's uh, Thank you, Tom. That's an incredible topic in its own right. It, all we have to do as doctors is look in our waiting rooms to see what's going on. These smartphones are the most abusive thing I've ever uh, I've ever seen as far as their impact on vision and what they're doing to the human visual system, and our young kids are starting on these things at two and three years of age. So you have an you know you have a toddler with a very immature accommodative and fiction, fixation accommodation and all these other processes that are going on. The hand and eye coordination is still developing, and we're sitting these these little toddlers in front of these these instruments which are testing and pushing their vision and causing responses to the vision stimulus that may be unhealthy for them in the long term. So lifestyle, where does it begin and where does it end? I mean, it's it's out of control. Chromebooks in the schools, we just have to draw the line here and start re re rethinking absolutely how we're treating our fellow human beings and our children. But and about the past and, and present. In the past, it, w it was dynamic. The visual process was dynamic. The, the, the man was working in the space. He was continually changing the, his posture, his accommodation, his convergence. He was using the peripheral. There was a lot of peripheral sti pre stimulation. He worked in a tridimensional space. He was not intellectual. Now it's totally different. We are static. Our posture is static. We are seated all the time. We are working with central vision on a bidimensional plane, and this is very intellectual. This is also the difference. Can you get into perhaps some of the other changes from past to present as regard to perhaps outdoor time? Yes, it, it, it's interesting. What is the connection with outdoor activity as far as being the limitations on myopia. And I want to also stress here that it's not what it's thought out to be as far as a myopia fix, because if you don't get those children outside soon enough and they start to become nearsighted, the effects of the benefits of, my, of being outside with the sunlight is, is you know, minimized dramatically. But you know, it, I think part of it is, is, as Marina was alluding to, it's the, it's the far field and the near field. I think when you're outside, you're into a much brighter situation and you're into a far field. 
your reference points are much further away instead of the near field that we send, tend to find ourselves in on a continuous basis in front of all these different devices all day. So again, I second what Marino has been talking about here about the fact that it's all you know it's all this short little fixation points instead of these far more dynamic fields that we've been working with in the past. So we have to take that all into consideration as far as its effect. And we haven't even begun to talk about other things, which is the dietary concerns. But that's all coming in our lecture. All right, so we've sort of touched on the problem, the epidemiology, you know, how posture affects it, how visual space affects it. What are some of the methods that we're going to be talking about in this particular workshop? Let's say optical strategies for myopia control. And about optical strategies, well, we use what research approved uh, recently in the last years. And to point out, peripheral vision is to be taken into consideration when developing optical strategies. So we'll analyze and rate actual strategies available for myopia control. We will uh, comment the, the conventional approach of a full-time full, uh, um, full time wear of, of full, full prescription. We will rate and discuss about under correction by focus on progressive lenses. The effect on the use of peripheral plus optics, which can be in contact lenses or in, in ophthalmic lenses. Also, the effect of uh, RGP. Not only orthokeratology or overnight orthokeratology, we are going to discuss uh, daily, daytime wear of RGP, which are using uh, optical defocus uh, philosophy and, and strategies. So we, we cover, even soft orthokeratology, of course. So we, we cover cover the entire field of what is available actually to try to minimize progression of myopia. Well, we've got you know the pharmacological end of it, which is a really exciting area that's just getting its infancy actually, and there's a lot of controversy in it. I travel around the world, you know, with talking about atropine and low dose atropine, and you hear all kinds of different things, and depending on who you're talking to. But it's certainly uh, something that we need to consider. It's, an, it's a very nice ad addition to your, your uh, treatment of myopia and should be added, I think, to, uh, you know, to the different types of myopia control we're doing. Uh, as far as the levels of atropine that we need to use, well, we'll talk about all this. But it's, uh, it's definitely something that's exciting, and there's a lot of potential here. All right. So, Carrie, what can you tell us about the structural approach to myopia control as it relates to ortho -K? Yeah, this part of our program with dealing on the structure is something that's well well known among our community anyway within the academy. We're talking about changing the the shape of the cornea, uh, different kinds of dynamics we can do to change the structure of the eye, and this is ortho K is a, without a doubt the um, the number one thing we use for that as far as myopia control is concerned. And then you also have of course soft lenses and other methods of of altering structure. But uh, diametrically, you know, when you consider that what we can do to the, to the human visual system by uh, reshaping the cornea, it's just amazing how you can make this into a much more efficient system for dealing with the, the curse of myopia that we have uh, to deal with today. And we're going to be talking about this extensively in our, uh, in our lecture and many new ways that we have of altering that structure that you can get even more optimizing the myopia control. It's really, it's really, it's really fun to be into this field right now and talking about these kinds of tools. Well, actually, you just touched on what my next question was going to be. We're going to be discussing perhaps the exact design changes that you're going to recommend for designing reverse curves, optic zone size, and orientation uh, to achieve the optimum myopia control lens. We're going to give you all the tools there. We're going to finish Bill Burke's famous, you know, the, the perfect lens design. <laughs> no, no, that's just kidding a little bit, Bill. But we're going to go after it. Yeah, we're going to discuss what we feel is the best, you know, designs for these uh, most efficient myopia control. And there's no secrets here. Everything's on the board. You'll see exactly what we're doing and what it's working in our practices, by the way. It's working with our studies, you know, with my famous friend, Dr. Eddie Chow, you know, some of his work, and then Marino and the RGP designer, and then all the other wave everybody else is doing. So we're going to actually optimize this for all different types of lenses that are fit and give our doctors, no matter what they're doing, they'll end up leaving that course with knowing a lot more about how to control myopia, even with the present designs they're already using. Wow, that sounds pretty interesting. Um, so, Marino, what about the functional approach? What 
things are you going to be talking about functionally to try and stem this tide of myopia? Well, as uh, uh, I said before, when we deal with the myopia control, we can work on the structure and we have to work also in the function. Uh, the structural approach is by changing the structure of the eye, but the functional approach is dealing with try to find out the way to make vision more flexible. So we may use, for instance, if a, if a child has a bad posture and is unbalanced, and his ocular posture is asymmetric, which can deal to an isometropia, we can suggest to use something that keep the, the posture more balanced. So why not to use an inclined plane? Why not to use some type of uh, lenses and prisms? So pl uh, pl use the pl use of plus, for instance, or vertical yoked prisms to try to make this vision more acceptable, to relieve some stress out of vision. So we are going to talk about vision training to make the visual system and especially the acromotive system more flexible. We will talk about the importance of the diagnosis and the, also the management. We have not, to avoid, we have to understand what, what is a, a accommodative access. We don't want to keep along with that so that the child is reading long time, very at a distance which is very short and adapt to, to the, the visual system to become nearsighted and progressing this. We'll make the point about the importance of an adequate visual exam, which has to include near point tests. What I'm getting from the two of you is that you're looking at this in a sort of a different light than we traditionally have considered it before. Traditionally, we're considering looking at optical strategies, we're looking at atropine, soft multifocals, orthokeratology. But it seems that you're talking more about lifestyle changes and visual hygiene. And I know, Carrie, you mentioned nutrition. And, you know, so why don't we sort of wrap it up with what are the lifestyle changes? What are the things that you're going to be talking about and recommending that we can offer to our patients on a more, I guess, holistic approach to treating not just the prescription, but treating the entire patient? Exactly, Tom, and well said. And uh, I want our doctors that are listening today and healthcare providers all who will get a chance to listen to this uh, and the citizens themselves, the public, to listen to this very closely. The dental industry has kind of summed this up for me. Uh, they have the dental hygiene. They teach their patients early how to take care of their teeth and gums and their mouth. And so we need to adopt that as a visual hygiene more than ever because we're in seriously more trouble with these things, the implications of, you know, you can get cavities and have serious problems with your, your mouth, and it can lead to heart disease even if you don't take care of your gums. But here with your vision, I mean, this can seriously, can if you let this myopia thing go, it can lead to blindness. So we need to take all of this very seriously. We need to develop a ourselves as doctors of optometry, doctors of ophthalmology, vision care specialists. We need to, to adopt a visual hygiene protocol that will encompass all of this and teach our patients how to live in this world we now live in, which is so threatened with all these different devices and all this near-point activity our kids are doing, and adults as well. Just the visual taxation and stress that comes from all that. We need to teach our patients and ourselves to begin with how best the visual system needs to be treated. And believe me, it does need to be treated at the best because this is what we count on. 80% of all we learn comes through our vision. So unless we take this seriously, unless we start developing these protocols, which we will be teaching in this course, by the way, then I think, you know, that's the, the place to start with, with dealing with what we're fa facing now. Marino, is there anything you'd like to add to that? The point to me is this. Can we prevent myopia? Can we minimize the progression of myopia? Can we help in having a visual system more flexible? But also, is it our duty to recommend to the patient and the family to have the children to play outside? And we recommend at least two hours a day. Is it appropriate to recommend to spend time outside on a daily sunlight day? to have a good illumination. And peripheral, we need a peripheral light 
well lighted, illuminated uh, world. We don't want the children to watch on, on cellular phone and iPad in the darkness in their room. We want it to recommend it to the parents to watch for the children to have a more balanced ocular posture, to read at a proper distance, to eat well. So is it our duty to recommend this, to start talking about this? I think it is. I agree. I agree. And come for more. There's, this is just the the icing on the cake. It's not even the icing on the cake. It's just a sniff of what's going to go on in the six hours of this myopia workshop we're doing on Thursday at BBD. So come for the show. It's quite a show. And the audience isn't going to be, get to just sit there either. We're going to make them part of the whole presentation. That's how we do things. We're interactive. So everybody's going to get involved. It's going to be a big, big, loud kind of thing. And we're going to all learn a lot more. Well, that sounds great, Carrie and Marino. Uh, I really appreciate you appearing on the podcast today, and I look forward to seeing you both in Dallas for Vision by Design. Have a great Amen. day. Amen. Thanks. Thank you. To join the discussion about this episode, log into the OrthoK podcast forum located on the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Controls web portal. This is Dr. Tom Wyshewski. Until next time, thank you very much for listening.